believe we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination except we have been called by his name. So let's go to Matthew chapter number 26. While you are turning there, um, I did uh, bring some uh, books. And uh, uh, I have three books we've written. I'm working on a fourth. It's going slow go, slow go. But um, the sale of these books does go for our building program building program. I told Brother Harrington we're building a condo in Jamaica. Praise God. (laughs) Just teasing it. Time we get done with our building program, I wish I was in Jamaica, but it is a church building program, and they're out there, and and, um, if you buy all three of them, it's an even $30, and if you don't, they cost 25 bucks each. Praise God. Just teasing, just teasing. Anyway, there's a good brother going to help us out there. And if you get one, I'd be, uh, and you'd like me to sign it, I'd be happy to sign it. If you, uh, if you take any uh, book that I have written and it's a signed copy and you go to Walmart, they'll sell you stuff. Praise God. So, um, that's the way it works. Hallelujah. They get, if you show it to them, they get real quizzical, impressed looks, uh, and they want your money. So anyway, uh, here we go tonight. I feel the presence of the Lord, and I do believe he's going to help us. Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse number 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas One of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master! And kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And please note, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more. Than twelve legions of angels shall give me more than twelve legions of angels. Amen. I'd like for us to pray one more time. And let's ask God that the word of the Lord would have free course. Lord Jesus, we are very very, 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 very mindful of you. God, we have no time to waste. And God, we need your hand to rest on us, on our every single heart and mind and soul. And God, lay your hand on our spirits. Teach us, mold us, make us, lead us, guide us. Cause us to be more like you that we can do more of your work effectively. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. You may be seated. 
Praise the name of the Lord. Whenever we think or hear upon the life, teachings, and ministry of Jesus Christ, and the phrase, great temptation, comes into play in the process of that, our mind usually, immediately, if we're familiar with his life, reverts to the wilderness temptation, where Jesus, upon the heels of a 40-day fast, that's 40, 40-day fast, amen, which in itself would be an unbelievable ordeal. And that took place in a very, very, very desolate, horrid, bleak wilderness experience. Amen. I went on some fast in my life. I need to go on one right now. And uh, I've went on some pretty lengthy ones, but I've never done anything like that at all. But those that I have gone on, I like to make sure I'm surrounded by people that can wait on me. Praise God. And prop up my pillow and feel sorry for me and ask me if I'm going to make it. All kinds of things. But Jesus went out into the Judean hills of desert. And there he was alone, save for the presence of the Spirit. Amen. But I guarantee you there were many, many, many days he felt no presence or spirit. At the end of that, the devil came to him, and we know that he tempted him to turn stones into bread. He took him to the pinnacle of the temple and 240 feet in the air, said, uh, jump off of here. It's written. He'll give his angels charge concerning thee. And then he inserted these words found in the New Testament, but they are not found in the Psalms 91. Amen. He said, Thou dash thy, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. The words at any time were inserted of the devil, playing upon the humanity and the self will of the man Christ Jesus. And he still does that because he's not changed. And when he plays the self will card, it's a pretty effective card in most lives. And uh, then as we know, in a moment of time, he showed him the kingdoms of this world. I think that's pretty interesting that when it comes to the kingdoms of the ages to come, the Bible tells me that of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. So it apparently is going to take God eternity to show us his unfolding kingdom. But the devil could get all of the glories of his kingdoms together in one fell swoop. You'd see it in a split second. And uh, it was impressive, no doubt. But compared to that of the ceaseless ages, it is a flash in the pan. But he said, I'll give all of this to you if you will but fall down and worship me. And we know that Jesus refused it all based upon Scripture. Amen. And then the Bible tells us that the angels came and ministered unto him. I would like to propose to you, however, that when we think of the term, the great temptation of Jesus Christ, uh, I know that after I saw this the way that I want to, God will help me show you that whenever I think and hear of the phrase, the great temptation, my mind does not go down to the area of the Dead Sea. My mind goes to the text which we have read as being the truly greatest temptation of Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what I want to preach about. And if you need a title 
Mr. Soundman, that'll be it. The greatest temptation of Jesus Christ. The greatest. We know that while the wilderness was horribly bad, there is no record in that 40-day ordeal of him praying as it were great drops of blood. There was no agony upon him. There was no pressure, if you will, that would cause him to go into such a frothing agony, amen, of trial and torment that he would sweat as it were great drops of blood. Amen. And though angels came and ministered unto him at the end of both of those ordeals, in the wilderness there is no record of Jesus saying, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Amen. So this was a special time, amen, in an exceedingly, obviously, most special life that ever lived. It was not simply that he knew and did not want to hang naked in front of passerbys that would mock, amen, possibly clear their throat, and if they covered him at all, it would be with spittle. It was not a man that he might possibly be covered with blood that would be dripping from his back and from his crowned head. It was not simply a man, the blood, that would be pumped out through pierced hands and pierced feet. And all of those things, we know, a man, if they were facing us in just a couple of hours, and you knew it was coming, you'd be a troubled man. You'd be a troubled woman. Amen. Yet for all of that, he was somewhat prepared. He had spoke of that day often. He had known about it probably at least from the time he was 12. And in Hebrews 12 and 2 we find that who for the joy that was set before him, that is beyond the cross, because of that he endured the cross. And he actually despising the shame. One translation puts it this way, thinking nothing of the shame. Another says caring little for the shame. And another yet says he reckoned as nothing the shame that was set before him. Because he knew the joy that was beyond the torn veil. Amen. So I don't really think that it was all those factors, though God knows unbelievably weighty factors they are. I do not believe that is what would term this in his mind the great, great great temptation. I think, and I think I can prove it, that the greatest temptation of Gethsemane, of the prayer, the agony, the beatings, amen, the mockings, the nakedness, the nailings, His visage marred more than any other, a spectacle to heaven and earth. Beyond all of that, the greatest crucible, amen, upon which he had to surrender his will was based on the fact, and this was his greatest temptation, he knew, he absolutely knew he could get out of it. And be totally justified. And who could have condemned him? Or blamed him? You say he had to go through it. Well, who says he did? Amen. I think he shows us that he didn't have to. 
Now, in Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, he states that a legion was 6,005 men. That's in Gibbon's Decline and Fall. There's been a lot of speculation how many a legion was. He states a legion of the Roman Empire was 6,005 men. Jesus, when Simon Peter made his move, and he brought out the sword. And he took off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. When this was done, amen, Jesus said, put up thy sword into thy sheath. Don't you know that I can right now pray to my father and I could have 72,030 plus angels at my instant disposal. All I've got to do is ask. That's all i got to do. Now, brothers and sisters, either he could or he couldn't. Either he could or he's lying. And if he's lying, let's just leave here anyway. He absolutely knew I can stop this show right now. I don't have to go through with this. All I've got to do is utter a prayer, and it'll be far less than Elijah's 64-word prayer, and say, send the legions of angels now. And it would be over. Amen. John 14.10 says, Believest thou not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. John 3.34 and 5, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. Can I propose to you tonight that the single greatest trial, trauma, and temptation of Jesus Christ was in the garden. Amen. And I believe it's then and there that he had to pray and pray. And pray, and pray so hard that it was as if great drops of blood would come from him. Because when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. And I think. Right then and there, it was revealed to him, it's possible. Pray, and I will send more than 12 legions of angels. Why didn't he say five legions or 25? Amen. You know there's more than 72,000 angels up there. Amen. Even the children of the beloved, their angels do... The face does shine before our Father. Hallelujah. So how many kids are in the truth today? Got the picture? There's more than 12 legions of angels. Where did he get the number 12? Why was it not 20? Why was it not 4? Amen. He heard a distinct number, and it was placed in him. You can ask right now. And again, when he said, don't you know, I can right now pray, and I can get them now. Again, he either could or he couldn't. He was either lying, or pulling our leg, amen, or sadly deluded. I'm here to tell you, he knew he could stop it all right then and there. And I want to propose to you that that, that point right there was the greatest temptation of Jesus. Hallelujah. Because he knew I can get 
out of this and be totally justified. I can be totally justified. If the greatest temptation of Jesus Christ was, and I believe without question it was, the fact that when he knew this, he said, nevertheless, I'm not going to call the legions. You've told me that I could. I could have more than 12 right now. All I've got to do is say the word. But I'm not going to do that. Holy, harmless, undefiled, no fault in him. There was no reason he had to suffer like that. But isn't it something that he who knew no sin became sin for us? That the likes of you and I could become. We know so much sin. But the likes of you and I could become the righteousness of God by him. Hallelujah. And as one translation puts it, amen, God treated him the way we deserve to be treated. So that now we are treated the way he truly deserved to be treated. Isn't it something? Amen. Every now and then, my mother or my brother or my sister-in-law, amen, in Pueblo, Colorado, my old haunts, they will go about and in the process of writing a check or putting a credit card or whatever. There'll be a teller or there'll be, amen, uh, uh, someone at the counter, and they'll see the name Booker. And even to this day, now it used to be, it used to be, they would say, are you related to Larry Booker? Yeah, it's my brother-in-law or my brother or my son. And they would say, what's he doing now? And they expected to hear that I was in a mental institution or a penal institution or I was in the grave because I was headed one of three places as fast as I could go. And my mother and brother and sister-in-law would say, well, actually, he's pastoring a church in California has a wonderful wife and children and doing quite well. And when I think of how good God has been to me, and I think about Jesus, and I think about Calvary, and I think about Him on the tree, I think about how He suffered, how He bled, how He gave up the ghost, when He didn't have to do it, but He did it for the likes of me. He was treated the way I deserve to be treated. And now God's been so good to me, I'm being treated the way He deserves to be treated. But He didn't have to do it. He said, I'm telling you, I can call 12 allegiance right now and stop it all. But He did not. His greatest temptation was the fact that he could and been justified. But he didn't. Can I propose to you, Mr. Salmon, I need a little more monitor. It's not your fault, it's just what I've been up to, praise God. Our very greatest, deepest, most trying temptation. I want to propose to you, come when we feel the most justified. When there's no justification, when there's no semblance of it being right, when it's such a black and white issue of right or wrong, those can be big depending on where you are spiritually. But nevertheless, you actually have to overcome a lot of right reasoning and teaching and things you've been taught. No. Amen. You, 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 you have to wade your way past conviction and on and on and on. But when you could be so justified, and when there are others that would pat you on the back and say, well done, and when there would be others that would say, I don't blame you, and when there would be others and say, it's about time. 
when you feel, amen, that the situation has risen to the place that you would be most justified. Can I tell you, those are the hours and moments of our greatest temptations. That's when we must be so careful. Amen. And again, I think we can go to the word of the Lord and see times and places and situations in the roads of life. One quick cursory glance. Amen. The story of Abraham and not story as a fable, story as is a factual happenstance. When the Lord one day said to Abram, Abraham, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. And he could have said, whom you waited for 25 years to receive. And since he's been born, you have doted upon, and who has become, as it seemeth to me, the apple of thine eye. This promised child. Amen. And how old the lad was is anybody's conjecture. But he wasn't a little toddler. He was old enough to carry enough wood up to the top of that mount that could burn him to a crisp. Amen. We're not talking about a little bit of kindling. We're talking about a stack of wood. And if a boy can carry up that kind of wood, that boy could also throw off the restraining arms of his father. And say, Daddy... You have taken this religious thing a little too far. And daddy, listen, uh, uh, I've heard a lot of stories about how I got here. And a lot of the miracles behind it. And I've heard mama and I've heard you brag about it. Amen. To, to everybody that's willing to come by and spend some time. So for it to come to an end like this, I think you've gone over the edge. Do you understand? It was not just Abram, Abraham being tempted, but it was Isaac. And it was not just fatherhood, but it was sonship. And these we receive in a type, the Apostle Paul said, not dealing with dualism, but dealing with a great God that cannot die and cannot be tempted and tempteth no man, hallelujah, and has no blood to shed. That God who is invisible, hallelujah, who overshadowed a virgin by the name of Mary and through her womb, he himself was in the world and the world was made by him without controversy great was the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh and so you have authority and submission wrapped up in the same body and god that could not die through the auspices of that humanity could taste death for every man and god who tempts no man and cannot be tempted that God could in all points be tempted through that man. And God that has no blood to shed would shed the sinless blood for the sins of the world through that man. And you can only imagine how much Abraham loved Isaac. Can you fathom how much the Father loved the Son? How much the divinity loved the humanity? How much the Spirit loved the flesh? That did all those, always those things that please him. And then the words that he spoke, I, he said, I speak not of myself. The Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. How deep, how great, how fathomless was the love affair for that father and that son. To where when that son finds himself on his knees in a garden, bowing over and saying, If it's possible, let this cup pass from me! can have more than 12 legions. Just say the word. Not my will. And when the sword starts swinging, pull it up, that tawdry stuff. Receive your ear back. We could have more than 72,000 angels here at the snap of my finger. But there's something bigger than 
my ego. And there's something more important than my flesh. And there's something far larger than how I'm about to appear to humanity for a brief few hours. There is an eternity of ever unfolding glory, the increase of which shall see no end that hangs on this decision that I have the right to make. And Isaac could have said, Father, you're over the edge, Dad. And the father could have said, but God, he's my promise. Of the ten great trials of Abraham. Amen. We won't go into them, but there's ten great trials of Abraham. By far and away, the greatest was taking that boy. And if there was ever, 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 ever a time when he had to struggle, it had to be at that one. When he would feel the most justified. All! 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 He'd have had to do is say, God, you're no better than Chemosh. If you do this, the Moabites are as good as we are. And what could God have said? Thy will be done. And the angel of the Lord stopped him and said, Now I know what I wanted to know. I had to know. I had to see it. I had to receive it in a figure. When we're, our greatest trials come from our greatest temptations come from our moments of greatest justification. Such as Moses. That could leave. I'm telling you, could turn his back and walk out on Pharaoh, on the palace, possible throne, the wealth, the riches, the grandeur, the glory, the obedience done to him all his life. And he chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God. Amen. Knowing that the pleasures of sin, they're just here for a season. But uh, I got there's a God, and, and I'm going to tell you, he has great recompense of reward. And he goes on and on and on. And we know the story and, and the backside of the desert for 40 years and the disenchantment and disillusionment and, and thinking of the broken dreams that whatever happened to him, where did they go? I, I thought it was God. I, I guess I was so wrong. How could I have been so wrong? I'm an idiot bent over man. Amen. And it seems like life has passed me by. But we know the burning bush. We know, amen, the rod. We know the Red Sea. We know the ten plagues. We see it all. But it was that daily, incessant, drip, 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 dripping, pecking, bugging of those people. Day by day, week in, week out, month after month, 40 long years he suffered with that generation. He wasn't three days in there when they started complaining and they were ready to kill him. Stone him and go back to Egypt. Amen. Finally one day they're murmuring around and God said take the rod and hit that rock. And the waters came out. Now it's four decades later and they've been pecking and poking all those. I don't mean to bug you, but it gets old, don't it? Amen. And just, but it, I'm just going to do this for a couple of minutes now. Can you imagine me staying here for 40 years? Amen. And there they are. And it goes on and on and on. And one day they're thirsty again. And they're back to clamor. Why didn't you just let us die in Egypt? And God says, take the rod. Go back to the rock. And speak to it. But make sure you take the rod. God told him to take the rod. And go back to the rock. And speak to it. So he's got the rod. In his hand. Amen. And God told him to get it. So he got it. And. Uh, 
He's standing there. And he's looking at the sullen faces and the jutted jaws and the furrowed brows and the smirks and the haughtiness, the insolence and the unthankfulness that is reeking from a congregation that is so soon to forget the sacrifices of a man and a God and a generation. And he's looking at them and they're clamoring yet one more time. Hey man, about the bogus business of following this God, and this so-called man of God. And God says, speak to the rock. They'll get their water. And he looks at it. He said, you bunch of rebels! And he smote the rock. And the water came out. And they jumped up there and they started lapping it up like dogs and having himself a time slurp. No thanks, no appreciation. He's feeling better. He didn't get it all off his chest, but he got a little bit of it off. While he's walking away, the Lord says, Moses, Yes. I didn't tell you to smack the rock. No, you told me to take the rod and speak. I didn't tell you to smite it. No, but you did the first time. I didn't tell you to smite it the second time. I told you to speak to it. But did you see the looks on their faces? Did you see the insolence that, and feel it that filled the air? The look of their smug, indifferent, cold, hard countenances. I, I, I got carried away. I just I got mad. I'm sorry. I, you told me to speak. I, I smote it. Yes, you did. Moses, yes, you're not going into the promised land. What you've dreamed for and worked for, and labored for and given your life for, in days and months and years and decades, you're not going in. I'll take you up to Pisgah and show you a good view. That's the closest as you're ever going to get. You're not leading them in. And they're going in. The rebels are going in. The insolent are going in. The troublemakers are going in. The unthankful are going in. And I'm not. That's right. Because you chose not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. And I told you a long time ago at the death of Abiram and his brother, I will be sanctified in them that draw nigh me. I'll be glorified in the ministry one way or the other. But the people are going to have the fear of the Lord. So, after they're done drinking, and their bellies are sated, and their, slurk, their thirst is slacked, you can tell them or have Aaron tell them. And can you imagine those people standing there? What now? You got another announcement? Huh? What now? And Aaron is ashen face. He's shaking. He can't believe it. Yeah, I've, I've got an announcement. Well, what is it? We got chores we got to do. What do you want? Moses isn't going into the promised land. What would you say? Moses isn't, he isn't going in. What do you mean he's not going in? God's not going to let him go in. What do you mean God's not going to let him go in? They quit chewing their gum. They sat up straight. What do you mean he's not going in? Where's he going? He's not going anywhere. God's going to take him for very long. He's not going to be allowed. Just like he did the first time. God told him not to smite it. He, God didn't tell him to smite it. 
God told him to speak to it. Yeah? He didn't speak to it. He smote it. Yeah? Your point being, he disobeyed God by smiting the rock instead of speaking to it. And God's not allowing him to go in. And there was a big collective gulp and gasp. And there was a newfound fear of the Lord that came upon some people. And God was magnified and glorified and sanctified in the eyes of the people. His greatest temptation was when he felt so justified, his cause so right, his moment so well deserved. He thought, if anybody ever has been provoked out of measure, it's me. But God said, no, 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 no. I'm going to tell you something. Our greatest temptations come in the guises when we can feel the most justified. And the list is long and endless, but I won't make this message long and endless. We could talk about Joseph and talk about his brothers. Amen. And the closest, the closest the man ever came to losing it, amen, was not in Potiphar's house and not with Potiphar's wife and not in the bitterness of the prison, amen, and not in the rancor over his brethren casting him into the, into the pit, amen. The closest he ever came was when ten older brothers come staggering in, famished and starving, amen, from, from, a, from a dearth upon the world that he had seen come in a long season and put in store for. And the closest that Joseph ever ever got was when he had his brothers jumping through some hoops because come on now pay back some medevac i remember the pit and 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 yet and yet in the midst of that when a brother would say this is the judgment of god on us because of what we did to our brother joseph he would break he'd get up from the throne he'd go off to the side he'd cry Our greatest temptations, our greatest trials come when we've been provoked the most and we feel the most absolutely justified. We could talk about David. Can I tell you something? Amen. His greatest temptation was not Bathsheba. You say it was his greatest failure. That was simply a moment that revealed a time of his greatest weakness. I'm going to tell you the greatest temptations he ever faced it. it was when his back was to the wall and the knife was to his throat. And there was a man hunting him like a flea on the back of a dog. A man that I had won battles for. A man that I'm the one that killed the giant, not him. The one, amen, he made me captain of thousands and I went everywhere I went and I helped ensure his throne. I helped establish it. I helped make him strong in the eyes of the nations, amen. That man that I was good to, that I was loyal to, that I played my heart for, that man that I fought battles for, that man that I laid my life on the line for and now he's hunted like a flea on the back of a dog and it's over over hill and over tail. Amen. It's as he runs to and fro and back and up and down the nation of Israel trying to hide, trying to flee. And now he's there with his bag of ruffians and he's in the back to the wall. He's in a cave. And guess who comes into the cave? It's the man that has made his life hell on earth. And to make it worse, Abishai on one side and Joab on the other says, This is the day that the Lord spake to thee of, saying, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do what is good in thy sight. 
Apparently somewhere, someplace, sometime, they had been in their hiding mode and around a campfire or here or there, David was singing a psalm and, and, and maybe one got to worshiping and then another and we don't know the, 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 the gist of it, but somewhere there was a prophecy given. Somewhere Gad uttered something or somewhere Nathan gave it and, and there was a thus saith the Lord. I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do what is good in thy sight. And everybody rejoiced. Because they knew what was good in the sight. Kill that turkey. Get it over with. Smite him. And Abishai said, this is it. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy. He's delivered him into your hands. Let me add him. You don't have to do it. I'll smite him once. I won't have to smite him twice. He's got a prophecy. His sails are full of prophetic utterances. He has fought his battles. He'd no doubt have been dead a long time ago from giants or something had it not been for David. He's bringing Israel down. The misery of his household. The misery of David's world. God told him he'd bring him into this moment. Can I propose to you the hour of his greatest temptation? was when he had him where he wanted him. And he could have brought him down to the grave in one fell swoop. He could have placed a crown on his head and who would stop him? And David said, No, There's a a verse back there somewhere. I'm dusting it off. It says, Thou shalt not touch the Lord's anointed. God will bring him down in battle for the way of man. But God forbid I touch him. God forbid. But, but, but that is what I choose to do. That is the fulfillment of the prophecy. That I will do that which is right in my sight. And what's right is for me not to touch Him. Our greatest temptations come. Amen. When we have the greatest justifications. I could stop right here. In fact, we could have a moment of silence and let you start filling in the blanks of things you're facing maybe even as I speak, of things that maybe you have thought about doing. Let's love the Lord just a moment. I love you, Jesus. 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 You know, I've not preached this message very much. I've preached it a few times, but it's been a long, long time. I've never told this story with this message. I've told this story sometimes in ministers' Sessions, classes, I've done it with ministerial leadership there. So I'm going to try and do it carefully here. Uh, The gist of it was, uh, I had a group of men who were uh, out to make my life a little bit on the miserable side. And while they were doing that, information came to me about an old man 
in my town that had not stepped inside an apostolic church of any kind for over 10 years. He had televisions in his home. This was this is back in the 70s. And he was married to a woman not of this faith. He went to no church. And I was in a little hot water for uh, preaching for people who don't have this fellowship card. How's that? Okay. And this man that was in that condition, he got a current fellowship card every single year. Signed that he was a minister in good standing. So there was a special call meeting for my benefit. And I went over to that old fellow's house. He was on what I found out to be his deathbed. I saw the card. And I was going to go to the meeting, and my wife was all for it. I said, baby, I'm going to let him go. And when it gets to a certain peak and point, I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to push the plunger, and I'm going to blow us all to kingdom come. Because I had the plunger, and I had the dynamite, and I... Was uh, and I had the attitude, so I was ready. <clears throat> and there was in the church that I pastored an old man, an old man. He was 92 at the time. He'd received the Holy Ghost in 1910. He was baptized in Jesus' name in 1915. In 1915, it was he and Charlie Smith together that went to Elton Bible Conference and brought this apostolic message. Him and Charlie Smith together. His name was David Lee Floyd in the book United We Stand. He was the first secretary, the very first one. This organization started in uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas in 1916. When he died, he and an old Assembly of God preacher were the only two men left alive that had been both in Hot Springs, Arkansas at the forming of the Assembly of God and in St. Louis when they showed the oneness brethren the door. And so that's the fourth book that I'm working on right now is about him and reminisces that he told me and that I taped and I'm trying to get it all together. So, at any rate, he didn't know anything about that meeting. Nobody in our church knew anything about that meeting because I made it a point not to take that kind of stuff to the pulpit. And I apologize that I did what I did tonight. But, so, I was prepared and I was going to the meeting. Well, I was fixing to have service that night and I was walking by the aisle and old Brother Floyd he grabbed my coat and pulled on. I said, yes, Brother Floyd. He said, Brother Booker, I really need to talk to you. I said, Brother Floyd, as soon as church is over. He said, I need to talk to you right now. I said, well, okay, Brother Floyd, what you got? He said, the Lord talked to me about you today. I said, did he really? Well, I just thought, you know, he was 92, you know. And um, I said, uh, is that right? What did he say? He said, well, he's pleased with you that you've set your face to seek him as you have. Well, I like that. That's cool. He said, how be it? Forces will rise against you. And you're not going to understand what I'm about to tell you. But Satan is about to withstand you in the form of the brethren. And he said, in two weeks' time, you're going to a meeting and you're prepared to say things and do things that if you do, it will haunt your ministry the rest of your life. And I got down on one knee, which was easier back then. (laughs) And I thought, somebody has been talking to people in my church. I said, Brother Floyd, I want to know now who you've been talking to. He got big old tears in his eyes. He said, I've been talking to Jesus. I laid on my bed till 2 o'clock in the morning. I tossed and turned. I finally said, God, I will go to the meeting. I will get my hide whooped. But I will never bring up the name of that old man. And I didn't. And it was as well. A month later, the old man was dead. And the only reason he 
kept his dues up. It was the only place on earth he could get any insurance, and he just needed something to bury him, and that's what that was. But I wonder where I'd be today now. I wonder, I wonder the rancor. I wonder how way would have led on the way, how bitter I could have possibly become. I'm, I'm going to talk to somebody here tonight. Amen. I, I got a word for somebody. Your greatest temptation is when you feel the greatest justification. Hallelujah. I'm somewhere you're going to have to sort this out. If there's things that need dealt with, you know, do deal with them if it's the thing to do. But, but, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I mean, you've got to remember that there's some things, they, they belong to God and they don't belong to anybody else. I mean, the Bible says the tithe is the Lord's. And vengeance is mine. Those are two things we don't touch. They belong to God. Our greatest temptations many times, they come in the guise of the greatest self-justifications. God, you got to check our heart, our mind, our soul, our spirit. Hallelujah. I could go on and on, but I'm not cutting to the chase. The man by the name of Ezekiel, come on, son of man. I will take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep. Neither shall thy tears run down. Don't cry, forbear. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire upon thine head. Amen. Put on shoes on your feet. Cover not the lips. Eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning. And that even my wife died. And I did as I was commanded. How do you think the man sat? The Lord has given him all this instruction. I'm going to take the weight of the side of your eyes in a moment. He doesn't know. He... At evening time, when the sun set, his wife died. Who wouldn't cry? Who wouldn't mourn? Who wouldn't cover their face? Who wouldn't sigh? When the people passed by, he set his face like flint. And when they walked softly by, and a few days later they said, What's wrong with you? When this nation is carried away, when he finishes off Jerusalem, he will basically set his face as he bid me set mine. As a sign to this people. When Nadab and Abihu went into the tabernacle, Offering up their strange fire. Scripture lending itself that possibly they had been inebriated with wine. Whatever all the strange fire was, it was fire not wanted, ordained, called for by God. And in the midst of it, the Bible said, a fire fell out on those two boys. And the Bible said they were consumed. Isn't that something? They were consumed. There wasn't enough left to pay attention. But the Bible said they carried them out in their garments. So the boys were burned up, but the garments were untouched. They could pick them up in the garments, the priestly garments, and carry them out. Meaning, God knew how to touch the man but leave the office intact. 
And when you get so good at dealing with preachers and their idiosyncrasies that you can perform that, you might think about it. But I'm telling you, it's better to watch God. He can take care of the man and leave the office intact. And not touch the garments. You say, but you don't know what he did. Our greatest temptations and trials many times come when we have the greatest justification. You say, you don't know what he did to me. You don't know the bad preachers I've met. Well, i got a word for you. You don't know the bad saints I've met. For every bad preacher you know, I know ten. And for every bad preacher I know, I know a hundred bad saints. But I know great godly saints, and I know great godly preachers. And that's God take care of that. God take care of that. God take care of that. I know this. I'm not going to spend my days getting withered up and bitter at people that don't mean business with God. Be them saint or minister or who they are. Let God be God. Let's be true. Let's be right. Let's be righteous. Hallelujah. I received a phone call here a few years ago. I remember baptizing this man, his wife, praying them through to the Holy Ghost, baptizing their 13-year-old son, praying with him until he received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They moved away. They moved back east. So when you live in California, that's anywhere, huh? I would see that mom and dad through the years, various times and places. They'd come up. They'd cry. They would thank me. They loved me. There wasn't one time we ever saw them. They didn't thank me profusely for the foundation we had, you know, preached to them, etc. One day they called me. It had been five years. Their boy Matthew was now 18. They begged me. They pleaded with me. Please. Please. You've got to talk to Matthew. You're the only human being he has respect for and he will listen to. They had gone to a place I really wish they hadn't have gone. I said, what's he doing? He's smoking. He's drinking. He's dating a girl of denominational background. She says she's a Christian. She don't even live by what very tiny, tiny little bit. That denomination, that's not in the truth, lives. And that's Matthew's girlfriend, and this is Matthew's life. Nobody can reach him. Nobody can talk to him. But he always loves you. And to this day, he speaks so highly. Would you please call him? And so I did. Matthew, how you doing? <clears throat> I'm fine. You know, Matt, let's just cut to the chase. You probably know why I've called. Yeah, I probably do. I said, is it the true report I've been getting? I said, well, Brother Booker, depends, of course, what you've been told. I said, are you smoking? Quietness. Are you drinking? Quietness. Are you dating a girl that doesn't love this? Biblical apostolic truth. He said, Brother Booker, I'm going to answer you, but please, before I do, can I ask you some questions? I said, yes. 
Brother Booker, is television still wrong? Is it wrong to watch things that are on television, video machines and things that? I want to know, Brother Booker, are those things wrong? The things you taught me, are they right or are they wrong? I said, I'll answer you and I won't hesitate, but I do want to know. Has your mother and father allowed that in their home? He said, no. Brother Booker, they live and teach everything you ever taught. My mom and dad love God. They have not wavered. He said, you want to know about my smoking, and my drinking, and my girlfriend? I want to know what's wrong with the church I'm in. I want to know why they laugh and sit around and cut up and carry on and they watch and tell them stuff that I know is not right. They want to get on to me about my smoking and drinking, but what about them? And I said, Matthew, you listen to me, boy, and don't you ever forget what I'm about to tell you. I don't care if the whole world spits in the face of God. It does not give you the right to do it. I don't care what they do, where they go. You know what's right, and you will be held responsible. Our greatest trials are going to come when we feel the greatest justification. Say, Brother Booker, I was enjoying this till now. I wonder why. Come on now. Come on now. We're going to get real with God or not. There's got to be something in us that says, God... I don't care what the whole world's doing. I don't care what... Listen, my Bible, let God be true and every man a liar. I want to live for Him. I want to walk with Him. I want to talk with Him. I want to be right. I want to do the things of God. I don't care what anybody does. Right is right and wrong is wrong and God is God. How far? Young lady in our church, Naomi. She joined the ROTC. I didn't know she was in the ROTC. She's in a public school. We have a, we have a Christian school. I tell her parents, I said, look, the, it's not my responsibility to teach your children. It's your responsibility to see that they get an education. And if they're in public school, that's fine. This is what you're going to have to do. Be with them. Do this. Da, 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 da. If they're in a Christian school, Whatever. Naomi's in a public school, and public schools where I live is where the devil walks their dogs. And uh, in the ROTC, she said, I'll join, but I will tell you this. I will never, ever wear anything but a skirt to the bottom of my knees, ever. I said, sure, that's fine. And they allowed her to do that. But after a while, she was so good, and she became this, and she became that. And they called her in one day and said, listen, the troop is fixing to go, and they're going to be a marching band, they're going here and there. And Naomi, you do have to wear slacks. And uh, that's the way it is. She said, well, um, I guess I just won't be able to go to that activity. Well, you, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. If, if you don't wear slacks, you cannot go. Well, I understand. That's fine. I, I, I just won't go. No problem. They came back a couple of days later and said, um, you have to go. You have to wear slacks. Well, I won't go. If you don't go, we'll see to it. You lose all the credits that you've garnered. She said, well, if that's what you have to do, I understand, but I'm, I'm not going to wear slacks. A couple of days later, they said, we want a meeting with your pastor and your parents. She said, well, that's fine. I'm sure they'd be happy to come. 
She said, but I want to tell you something. This has nothing to do with my pastor or my parents. This is me, and it's my conviction. This is me. This is me. They came back. You will be dismissed completely from ROTC. Do what you have to do. I understand. There's no problem. There's no problem. You know? A week later, they came back. All right. You can wear your skirts. In fact, all the girls of the troop have come to us. Every one of them. And they have said that as long as you are in ROTC, they will never wear slacks again. In every single function... Every single girl in our troop will wear slants, uh, dresses, skirts. They just want to know how long you want them. I'm going to tell you, God's still on the throne, and God's still a big God, and God's still mighty. There's still Daniels in this world. There's still Meshach in this world. God's going to have a church, you hear me? And I'm about to close. Musicians, come. Don't, don't play. Just give us hope. Amen. You can be seated. That's my last scenario, I think. i got a friend of mine, pastor's church in Oklahoma. Good man, good church. He noticed a man would start coming to service. He'd come in late. He'd leave early. Come in late, leave early. Never had a chance to meet and get a hold of him. Then he began to notice a new check showing up, tithes, offerings. It had to be this man. He'd come late, he'd leave early. One night, the pastor said, let's all stand. Let's turn around and shake hands. And he made a beeline back there. And the guy said, well, well, I wondered how long it would take for you to catch me. He said, pastor, listen, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Let me come. Let me pay my tithes. Let me give in the offering. I'm never going to be saved. I know what it is to be saved. I'm not saved. I'll never be saved. And just let me come and do that and partake of services. Long story short, many, many, many sessions later, the man tells him why he will never be saved. He said, I will never be saved because there is a preacher and I hate him. I will die hating him. He will die with my hatred upon him. If I could, I'd love to get my hands on him. I hate him. I abhor him. When he finally got it out of him, why? He said, I was raised in church. My sister and I, my sister was a lovely, beautiful girl. She was engaged to a preacher. And he named the preacher. And that preacher is a very good friend of mine. And said they were engaged to be married. And one day, this old preacher got a hold of my sister's fiancé and started telling him a bunch of junk and a bunch of lies about my sister. And that young preacher broke up with my sister, went on, married somebody else, became very successful. My sister! It killed her. It shattered her. She had a broken heart. She finally left the church. And while she was in her backslidden state, she died! And said, now she's in hell. And I will hate that old preacher as long as I live. Long story short. Comes to the place. He and that man are in the pastor's office. The pastor's got a hold of him by the hand. He's got him to the place. He's about to call the old preacher's name. And say, I'm going to say the name is Smith, okay? Brother Smith, I forgive you. I love you. And God forgive me. 
The man is shaking. The man is trembling. He's covered with sweat. The pastor friend of mine said, come on now. Come on, come on, say it. Ah, ah. Come on. Ah, ah. You got to say it. You got to say it. He's licking his lips. He's shaking. Drenched with sweat. Finally, he says... said it. I don't mean to be gross or graphic. I'm talking about how bad things can get in a person's life. He fell in a heap on the floor. He urinated, he defecated, and he vomited all at once. And he lay there on the floor in that wretched condition, sobbing, sobbing, sobbing like a baby. The pastor got down with him in the stench and the smell and prayed and prayed. Oh, the man sobbed and wept until he finally prayed him through to the Holy Ghost again. So another session. Clean clothes together. Been living for God for a little while and he knows it's time to call the pastor and tell him verbally he forgives him. But in the meantime, the old Brother Smith died. And it was too late to tell him he was sorry. So the next best one was my friend who had gone on to be a successful minister and married another woman. So with his pastor next to him, he calls identifies himself. My friend said, I remember you. He said, then you remember my sister? Of course I do. He went through the whole scenario. The whole bitter scenario. He said, it's too late to tell Brother Smith I forgive him. So I have to tell you. And I mean it. I'm sorry. My friend heard him. He said, Brother, I don't know how to tell you this, but you really need to know. Old Brother Smith never said one single word to me about your sister ever in his life. The reason I broke up with your sister is because I was praying and fasting and the Lord God spoke to me one day and I laid on the floor in bitter tears but He gently but surely let me know she's not the one for you. And He said, that's why I broke up with your sister. And the man... On the other end of the line, when he put the phone down, said, I've thrown away 25 years of my life over something that never even happened. And I wish I could tell you, musicians, I wish I could tell you that's the only person I've seen throw away elements of their life. Our greatest trials come in the guise of our greatest self-justifications. Somewhere, God, tonight, I'm asking you to talk to us. I'm asking you, I'm sorry if I went so long. I'm not sorry for anything I've said, but I'm sorry if I went too long. I want us to stand.
in Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.